Great, okay, welcome back, virtual circuit riders. This next phase, we're going to look at method of seminaries, and this may be of some interest to those of you who are in, in a method of seminary. It's the age old story of if it's not one thing, it's another. In other words, if you give a mouse a cookie, then they want a glass of milk, right? Not that you're a mouse. But rather, the call for seminaries was the call of the laity who had gotten a cookie by letting their kids go to college. And the Methodist Church created those and used wealthy benefactors to create them, as we saw in our last episode. But once you give those laity a cookie, then they want a glass of milk. Well. An educated clergy was the glass of milk they started thirsting for. And so the argument began to emerge now that these newly wealthy, nouveau riche uh, Methodist laity who could not only uh, be benefactors for local churches but for colleges, uh, they began to tire of hearing the old Peter Cartwright, Alfred Brunson, frontier message and began to yearn for an educated clergy as they had outgrown the small class meetings and were now newly educated by the Sunday school movement. Uh, but when the sons and ultimately daughters as we saw with the Wesleyan uh, Female Academy in Macon in the 1830s, once the educated sons and daughters came home they could not sit at the feet of the old school uh, uneducated Asbarian style preachers. And so the argument was put before uh, a number of general conferences, mostly by these two men here, that we need an educated clergy. They need uh, a special seminary experience. John Price Durbin, J.P. Durbin, was the man who was the Christian Advocate editor of the New York Christian Advocate, which was one of the largest circulation magazines within Methodism. He began to argue after his ele uh, elevation to Senate chaplain and his work as a professor precisely that uh, these captains and masters of industry and, and um, wealth would not sit at the feet of the unlearned, particularly their sons and daughters will go to other denominations. It's really an extension of the argument that Peter Cartwright himself argued that, uh, you know, the, the sons and daughters would go off to Presbyterian schools like Princeton or congregational schools like Harvard. So the extension of the argument was made by J.P. Durbin. He was also a missionary secretary, so he knew the power uh, as he's beginning to send out missionaries uh, around the world, the power of education, and so he begins to argue for an educated clergy. But it really took Randolph S. Foster, who was a brilliant professor at Drew, uh, later named Bishop, uh, who took the life of the mind as a frontier, that this was the new frontier, this was the missionary frontier. Of course, the hand of General Conference delegates in an 1856 uh, was death, but it would be another hundred years before that became the pram the primary avenue for uh, entry into annual conference as an elder and full member. The first seminaries were a place where the whole experiment of knowledge and vital piety were really put to the test. The earliest was the Newberry Institute in Vermont. Uh, this institution uh, was led by a, a, a returning missionary, John Dempster. Today we have the John Dempster Scholarships for United Methodists. Um, and so Dempster was a uh, missionary to South America who returned and became president of Newberry which ultimately moves to Boston and this is considered our first uh, our oldest seminary although it's only the oldest BU uh, is only the oldest because it predated in Newberry Institute. 
this missionary connection between knowledge and vital piety and returning missionaries leading early seminaries is is a is a strong theme in, in our in our history he later on leads and becomes president of Garrett Biblical Institute in Chicago in 1853 and so his imprint is over uh, both Boston and Garrett Evangelical from 1853. As we've indicated, Boston in 1839 and Garrett in 1853. The hyphenation is the Evangelicals. The Evangelical Association had a seminary training institute and it merged with the EUB. Uh, merger in 1968. The next one is Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, which you can see here, 1867. The next two are seminaries that we inherited also from our uh, antecedent con uh, denominations. United Theological Seminary comes from the United Brethren in Dayton, Ohio, and of course that was the longtime United Brethren Theological Seminary that we inherited in 68 with the formation of the UMC through merger with the Evangelical United Brethren. It started out in Dayton, uh, it's been moved to Trotwood, Ohio, uh, and uh, it dates, as it says here, to 1871. Wesley Theological Seminary was uh, the dedicated seminary for the Methodist Protestant Church. You'll recall the formation of that group. Uh, it is in Washington, D.C., not too far from the MPC's old uh, center of gravity, Baltimore. I think everybody knows where Washington, D.C. is, so I won't show it on the map. Uh, the next seminary, we'll have to look at the whole formation of uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church of the North had a uh, number of missionary uh, projects uh, funded by what was called the Freedmen's Aid Society to provide theological education for freed slaves in the South after the Civil War. And Gammon Theological Seminary in Atlanta is the first of these seminaries. Therefore, Gammon, which is a part of the ITC, the Interdenominational Theological Center here in Atlanta, actually predates uh, Candler for quite a, a number of, of years, uh, 30, 31, year, uh, 31 years older. So Gammon in Atlanta is still uh, one of our uh, great seminaries trained many of our leading African American uh, ministers of the last generation. The School of Theology at Claremont was the School of Religion for the Department of Religion as it were from USC in Los Angeles, California. Uh, I don't think I need to show you on the map. Iliff School of Theology comes next in 1892 which is uh, in Denver, and we'll look at the name Iliff uh, in the latter half of the 19th century and the formation of that school of theology in Denver. Then there's Candler and Perkins, which come together. Uh, we recall the story of Cornelius Vanderbilt and Bishop Mateer and the formation of Vanderbilt in 1875 to provide uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church South with uh, an educated clergy. There was a falling out uh, before the end of the 19th century between the Methodist Church bishops who had been the Board of Trustees and Vanderbilt University who wanted to control the appointment of professors to appoint more uh, progressive professors. And so the Methodist Episcopal Church South uh, rescinded their uh, support for Vanderbilt and then created uh, the Candler School of Theology in, eight, in 1914, building on Emory University's uh, 1836 founding in Oxford, and really setting the stage for moving Oxford um, 
the Oxford College site as the center to, to Atlanta. The School of Theology began the move towards creating graduate school education for uh, Emory uh, University and, and is responsible for actually creating the Atlanta campus. And we'll look at that story a little bit more. Perkins was what the Southern Methodist Church created for uh, its seminary west of the Mississippi in Candler through the work of the Coca-Cola magnate Asa Candler uh, gave the money for the eastern half. So these two become the leading uh, disciplers and uh, educators of, of Methodist Episcopal Church South clergy before the reunification in 1939. You've got Duke in 1926 that arises out of Trinity College, the Duke family being the tobacco uh, magnates of North Carolina. Uh, and you, some of you probably know where that is. And you've got St. Paul in Kansas City uh, from 1958 and Methesco, Methodist Theological School, Ohio, 1960, which was created before the reunification or the unification with the EUB. So that's why you have two Methodist seminaries today uh, in Ohio. So those are the, that's the chronological order of uh, the Methodist seminary. Very quickly, I just want to talk about the history of Candler. Uh, I already indicated the Vanderbilt backstory. Uh, bishop Warren Aiken Candler, who was the bishop, he was the chancellor of Emory University when it was at Oxford. He was also the bishop of uh, Georgia. His brother happened to be the owner of the Coca-Cola uh, company, not the founder, uh, but uh, uh, not the originator of, of it, but the founder of the, the company, not the originator of the actual formula, but they were brothers, and so Candler's money was able to uh, be funneled through Warren Aiken Candler for uh, the establishment. A million dollars given by Asa G. Candler down at Inman Park, uh, Methodist Episcopal Church South at the time. Uh, he gave a million dollars in the plate. Uh, you can still see that congregation today. Uh, the first site was down on Auburn Avenue, and I believe it's International Boulevard. I think it's a garage or maybe the AT&T building today. From 1914 to 1916, there was a great church auditorium there, and Candler had its original uh, meetings there. You can see here, these are the first buildings. Uh, this is present-day Pitts Library, which was the main facility of the Candler School of Theology. And then the other graduate schools and classrooms emerging. This is 1916. So the Quad of Emory uh, was created to surround uh, the School of Theology. And uh, you can see the burgeoning uh, campus at the time. You can see over here that this is before Woodruff uh, gave his multi-million dollar uh, benefaction. You can see that uh, uh, the field, the athletic field, was oriented a little differently. This was the original chapel, Durham Chapel, which is the reading room, as you can uh, probably, some of you have actually visited and, and read books in. So this was the, uh, the teaching chapel and the worship chapel. Bishop's Hall, which is about to receive the wrecking ball, uh, was dedicated in 1957. Uh, the southeastern jurisdiction of bishops seen here uh, were able to raise money for uh, the expansion of Candler. And at that time, you could just drive right up with your Beetle uh, or your 56 Ford and just park right outside. No need to walk from Peavine. What a life, huh? And lastly, one of the, uh, the great uh, expansions came when William R. Cannon, the great church historian, dean of Candler from 53 to 68, the first to hold a PhD and to hire a generation of PhDs to teach here. He was also elected bishop in the 1960s, and money from his estate as well as other fundraising led to the erection of uh, Cannon Chapel. And if you ever have a chance to talk with me about the story of the erection of student uh, of the Cannon Chapel, Students often find that story quite amusing. 
But we'll leave it at that, and now we've reached the end, and this is the material over which you will be tested uh, up until the Civil War and the Methodist uh, education and seminaries. So good luck, virtual circuit riders. I look forward to your excellent performance.